Hi folks, Matt Easton here of Scholar Gladiatoria. So, pretty much every year, usually actually two or three times a year in the human community, we have a situation where there's a, like a large tournament event. For example, Swordfish or Longpoint or one of these um, sort of events that put quite a bit of emphasis on the tournaments. I have to say, uh, we now put quite a bit of emphasis on the fight camp tournaments as well, but we're not seen as a tournament-centric event, um, so we tend to avoid this, uh, this kind of furore that happens um, after all of these events. And what essentially happens is after these big, let's call them sporting events, um, there's usually uh, someone or a group of people who get all up in arms and uh, gnashing their teeth and pulling their hair about the, um, the debate about sport versus martial art and there are always this debate always goes on in pretty much all martial arts whether you're looking at UFC or karate or even sport fencing I guess back in the day um, before it just completely went down the sport fencing route but you see it in Japanese martial arts for example the Kenjutsu Kendo um, sort of divergence and in HEMA we are obviously trying to recreate lost martial arts and a lot of people are concerned that if we go too much down a sport route then we'll become totally focused on the sport, much as sport fencing did um, about a hundred years ago, and we'll diverge further and further away from HEMA, from historical fencing, uh, and what the treatises and manuals that we study are actually talking about, that is life and death fighting, although it's not always life and death of course, they were also talking about um, dueling and all sorts of other scenarios, and, and in fact fencing for fun as well. Um, so. A lot of people get very concerned about the fact that we're going to end up with a sport HEMA um, and that sport HEMA will overshadow traditional HEMA. And we see the same thing obviously in, in Japanese martial arts has happened. Um, and Or that indeed that traditional HEMA will be completely eradicated or won't be seen as worthwhile or have as much um, sort of... Uh, credit given to it as, as it should do and that people will essentially evolve a new sword fighting style or weapon fighting style, not always swords of course, um, to, to suit competition uh, environment. And yes, it, to an extent it's always going to be true that if you have, and this is where my favourite word context comes in again, if you have a, a sport context for fighting, for making the most efficient way of scoring points and winning in a competition, it's not always going to be exactly the same as what you do in a real fight, because a real fight context is often either very different or at least slightly different to the sporting context. Having said that, there's lots of things of course that sport um, has that just general sparring um, doesn't have. Uh, there's, there's pressure and um, performing under pre you know, performing under stress, um, fighting against an opponent who you may never have fought before, um, all of these sort of things. Um, so, in actual fact, there's lots of martial things which you get in a sporting competition context, which you don't usually get in a usual sparring context. So, sport's actually very useful in, in, in that way of testing the martial side. But what it comes down to for me, actually, this whole debate, when I, when I read it going over and over and over again, the same things being said hundreds of times repeated, um, going round and round in circles, year in, year out. Um, and bear in mind that I, I can kind of see both points of view in that I'm a, what I'm trying to do is recreate lost martial arts. That's my primary goal. My end goal isn't to win competitions. Although my foot is in the other camp, that I actually like fighting in competitions and have fought in lots of competitions. And I have fought um, those you know big names in competition like um, T.S. Cool and uh, Piamarco Terminiello and Arto Fama and Rhinus Rinka and and these various people, I have, I have fought them in competition and I have sometimes beaten them and sometimes lost against those people. Um, so, and, and I've won a few things. So I, clearly I do have some, I'm not the biggest um, sort of, I don't get to lots of events so I don't get to compete a lot these days, but I nevertheless have done in the past and I have competed. So I'm not anti-competition at all. But equally, I'm not anti. I'm not like so pro competition. I'm like let's go running towards sport and ignore all of the traditional stuff. I'm actually, you know, completely balanced. I think, and I hope anyway that um, I, and I try to be balanced from both viewpoints. But when I see these debates going over and over and over again, what I see a lot of the time it comes down to is actually the 
the division between medievalists and, let's say, late Renaissance onwards people. What I mean by that is that fundamentally what medievalists, and you've got to bear in mind that medievalists, mostly longsword as this being, um, they make up the majority of people in HEMA, or at least they certainly make up the most vocal majority of people in HEMA. And if we take an event like Swordfish, which has just happened um, a few days ago in fact, um, the longsword competition is seen as the sort of the apex of the event, the highlight, the climax of the event, despite the fact that there's a sabre com competition and a rapier competition and this year an invitational sword and buckler competition as well and a wrestling competition. Those kind of live in the shadow of the longsword. Why this should be? Well, I guess because longsword is probably the most popular weapon in HEMA currently. Um, it just, it's the most, it gets the most attention, for whatever reason, rightly or wrongly. I would say wrongly, actually, because it was only used for a small amount of time. And actually there are other weapons which have far more sources devoted to them um, with used for a far longer period of time. But anyway, um, the longsword gets lots of attention, and so lots of people, when they enter this debate, are longsworders and looking at it only from a longsword point of view. And the problem with medieval martial arts and longsword is actually in terms of competition fighting, which did happen historically, and we know that, absolutely, we actually know very little about it. Matt Gallus has probably done the most work on um, trying to recreate or trying to research Matt Gallus and Steve Hick, actually, and, and Scott Brown, um, ha have looked at the Belgian Guild fencing rules for longsword fighting. And the thing is, they're incredibly different. These traditional rule sets that were used in the age of the longsword, when they didn't have fencing masks and they didn't have the nice uh, protective gloves that we have, unless they wore gauntlets, but there's no evidence they did that, they didn't have the safety gear that we have. So the competitive fighting for longsword looked probably very different to the competitive fighting we have for longsword now. You know, just not having a fencing mask changes everything. Um, we know that in the um, German uh, sort of factual uh, competitions that they did strike to create, uh, to cause a bleeding wound on someone's head, usually done with the flat of a Fedeschwert, not the edge of a Fedeschwert. So we know that in competitions they were striking to not obviously, you know, completely slaughter their opponent. They were striking in such a way to cause a wound, but a moderate wound and in fact there were fines for wounding someone badly like if you accidentally popped someone's eyeball then you had to pay a big fine for it. This is a massively different context to the type of longsword fighting we do now. The type of longsword fighting that's done in modern HEMA is essentially done like modern sport fencing but with our own rules. But the gear we use is very similar, you know we've got head to foot protective gear, we strike wherever we like, we use Fedeschwerts but we use Fedeschwerts to hit with the edge, and we know that historically they were often used to hit with the flat, um, and they were only aimed at certain body targets. Uh, Joachim Meyer, I believe, talks about not using the thrust um, in competitions and only striking with the edge, so again that's very different. So essentially, what we know from the German, the Belgian and the Italian sources, we know a bit about Italian fencing rules from the Bolognese sources, Anonimo Bolognese um, and Magellino, I think. Um, and what we know from those historical rule sets is really different to what we use in the modern rule sets. So that creates a problem, and that creates a point of argument, and that creates a, um, an opening for people who fundamentally don't want to compete, or aren't fit enough to compete, or uh, feel threatened by competitions, or the way that HEMA is developing, and they like the way it was, and they don't want it to change, whatever their motivations are, it gives an opening for these people to go, ah, well, you know, this um, sport longsword that you're doing now at Long Point or Swordfish or wherever, or Dijon or Fight Camp, this, this sport longsword you're doing, that's nothing like the traditional longsword. And the problem is they're kind of right. Um, they're right because that's not, the way that we do competition longsword now is not how competition longsword was done back in the day. However, what this comes around to is actually if we move a little bit later in period, if we go to the 17th century, we know that rapier fencing, and indeed quarter staff and, and other weapons, but let's just take rapier. We know that rapier fencing was done competitively, and they didn't have fencing masks, but what they did have, and are explicitly described in various sources, including um, Swetnam, for example, from 1617, 
is a padded ball on the end of a flexible bladed rapier. And we know that they made, specifically made, rapiers with flexible blades that were blunt, um, that had a little padded ball on the end that was um, big enough so it wouldn't pop your eye out and you can thrust someone in the face with one of these. Even if predominantly they weren't necessarily aiming at the face, we know that in later small sword practice, before mask was common, it was, um, it was considered impolite to thrust someone, even if they were wearing a mask, in the fencing mask. And that's why in modern foil fencing, in fact the mask is off target and only the uh, torso is a target. That's an old safety rule from the, from the 18th century and possibly late 17th century to avoid thrusting the face because either they couldn't trust the masks or they didn't have masks. Um, so, but once we get into this later period, into the 17th and 18th centuries, we start to see um, competition fighting done at the same time as swords were used for real that is actually getting pretty similar to what we do now. In fact, I would go as far as to say it's basically the same. There are, in various Italian rapier treatises, they discuss rules for fencing um, that are very, very similar to what we use now. Um, even the right-of-way rule is described as far back as um, 17th century, even though most HEMA people are opposed to the right-of-way rule, it is actually pretty historical, especially to the um, rapier and small sword. Um, and once we get into the 19th century, BAM! We've got um, sabre, single stick and bayonet and quarterstaff um, all being done with basically the same gear as we have. Padded gloves, padded jacket, fencing mask. Uh, and usually throw protection and often leg guards as well. In the case of um, bayonet, sabre and um, single stick sometimes and, um, and quarters off they wore leg guards as well. So essentially in the 19th century, which bear in mind, bayonets were probably, historically, bayonets probably stabbed more people in history than longswords did. So actually bayonets were hugely used and they did both bayonet drilling and bayonet fencing. And at no point in the 19th century does anyone really go, oh, well, you probably shouldn't compete in, um, in sabre um, sabre fencing competitions, military sabre fencing competitions, or bayonet fencing competitions, because it will make you a worse soldier. No, actually, it will make you a better soldier if you practice fighting more. That's the point. You practice fighting more, you compete more, it will make you a better martial artist. That's true. The important part, really, is to bear in mind the rules that you fight to. And this is where I bring it back to sport fencing and why I would say sport fencing, whilst it can turn you into an amazing fencer, the rules that they use are very far removed from what you'd want to do in reality. Let's take Epe. So um, Epe is, I can't remember the fraction, but it's like a 25th of a second um, between one person hitting the other one and the person who hit, I think it's a 25th of the second, it's dictated by the speed of electricity in a circuit, I believe. Um, but the person who hits first by a tiny fraction of a second gets the point. Well, clearly, martially, if you've trained to always just get, get that blow in on someone's arm before they thrust you through the face, that's pretty stupid in a martial setting. You're going to die a lot, and you're going to die very quickly. In fact, a fraction of a second quickly. Um, so clearly where you hit on someone's body is very important, you know, um, thrusting someone in the toe uh, and then getting thrust immediately afterwards in the face is very clearly martially bad behaviour. Equally, hitting someone a fraction of a second before they hit you is martially bad behaviour. Um, uh, overbalancing and overextending yourself, putting yourself into a stupid flying lunge in a, in a flunge position in order to get that first point on when you'd be completely vulnerable after your blade goes into the opponent's arm and through their arm and then they repeatedly stab you in the chest. That would be a bad thing as well. So clearly there is always going to be a difference between sport and martial. But what we do in HEMA, what we do in HEMA sport, if you want to call it HEMA sport, is really different to that. And we're never going to go down that route because we're doing HEMA. Um, if we wanted to go down that route, we're just going to do sport fencing or kendo. Um, the fact of the matter is that we are in HEMA pretty much obsessed with trying to create a competitive environment where we can fight with the weapons in the way that we think they should be used. And the fact of the matter is, as many people have said actually on uh, Facebook I was reading this morning, various people have pointed out that since we started having um, more competitions and a higher level of competition in HEMA, 
we've started to see more and more and more high quality historical fencing, more and more observation of the afterblow, um, people covering each other better, less double hits, all of these kind of things. You can encourage and you can even enforce better behaviours, better, more martial fencing behaviours in the fencing through the rules that you apply and through the judging and the way that the judging is implemented in the competition. So competition can be a great force for good and promoting good historical fencing with martially sensible technique. I've always been a big proponent in my uh, competitions at fight camp of heavily punishing double hits uh, to the point of even disqualifying people from the entire competition for double hits. And um, some people disagree with that uh, and I can understand the reasons to disagree with that uh, and it was and has been partly an experiment and all experiments must be allowed to succeed or fail um, and I think the experiment has largely succeeded. It doesn't mean that I will always keep it like that in the future but what we have definitely seen is a reduction in the number of doubles. This is partly because just everybody's getting a bit better and everybody's getting into their mindset that doubles are really really bad. Mutual suicide is useless. Um, but equally I think it's if you go to a competition and the people who are getting all the double hits are just being weeded out, then very clearly that's a sort of natural selection going on there. And people will either evolve or they'll drop out of the out of <laughs> out of that, you know, sort of system. Okay, so they have to if they want to stay in that system, they have to get less double less doubles. There are different ways of achieving that of course. I won't say that my way is the only way. Um, so essentially this comes back to my point of I think a lot of the debate comes back to the point of long sworders and medievalists having a lack of context and a lack of background information, a lack of source material to describe how did long sword people in the 15th century or sword and buckler people in the 14th century, how did they compete? Um, and we know they did because it's referred to but we don't really know very much. But you know what? People who say, ah, oh, what you're doing, the way you're competing is not historical. It is historical. It is historical to the 17th, 18th, 19th centuries, and of course the 20th century to a degree. Um, and, you know, people in the 17th, 18th and 19th centuries were using weapons for real. It wasn't that those were modern times and suddenly they stopped stabbing each other with bayonets and knives. N they didn't. They carried on, in fact, probably in far greater numbers than had happened during the medieval period because there were a lot more people and armies were a lot bigger. Um, in the, from the 17th century onwards. Um, so there we go guys, there's some of my thoughts. I know it's been a bit rambling and not very structured. I was going to write notes for this but I thought no, I just uh, try, try and do it off the top of my head um, because I think you get a bit more of my feeling in it that way rather than me re reading off a crib sheet. Um, so I do think competitions in HEMA are a good thing we always have to be vigilant, um, but I think that we are anyway. And I understand people's concerns that we're going to go down a sport fencing route, but we're not because we're HEMA and we'd be doing sport fencing if that's what we wanted to do. Um, and a competition definitely was historical, definitely was done. The medieval period, yes, we don't know much really about how they competed. And what we do know about how they competed was very different to how we compete now in Longsword. Yeah, we just have to accept that. I do think we should start doing more with the historical rule sets and the historical equipment, or lack of equipment as the case may be, i.e. no fencing masks, and seeing what happens, doing it carefully of course and responsibly. Um, because I think that there's a lot to be learned from that and there's not a huge number of people really experimenting with that. Um, but, but lastly, just to say that, you know, the way that we are competing now is not really very different to how we know they were competing in the 17th century without masks but with a padded ball on the end or the 18th and 19th century with masks and basically the same gear as we have now. Cheers folks! Thank you for watching. Please subscribe and feel free to follow us on Facebook.